Shalom everyone, this is Amir Tzalfati and this is Pastor Barry Stagner Good and behind morning. us behind us is the crazy group that woke up so early. <laughs> um, we, we want to believe that they woke up to uh, watch the, fa the um, um, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Instagram Live, but actually they woke up to see, you know what, let me show you what. They woke up to see this. We're about to watch the sun rising right above the Sea of Galilee. However, let's go back to um, um, our ugly faces. Oh, our, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And um, why don't we start with a prayer, Pastor? Uh, mine will be in English. Yours will be in English. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you made. Lord, we thank you that you have uh, thoughts toward us and plans for us of peace and not of evil, and we have a future and hope through Christ. So, Lord, we ask your blessings, not just on this time, but on this day around the world, yes. uh, for those who love you and uh, keep and proclaim your word. So, bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, again, shalom and good morning, everyone. It's almost 6 a.m. here in Israel. I have no clue who won. Um, Me either. Okay, you're in denial right now. <laughs> I am. Okay, let uh, let me guess. The Rams just lost. The Rams lost. Okay, I saw well, the score at halftime at three oh, to nothing, wow. New England. So okay. I thought, oh. Okay, well then uh, let's focus on uh, the news and <laughs> something important. Uh, something way more important. Than that. Yes. So we are so glad to be live here uh, from the city of Tiberias, from the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Shalom to all of you on Instagram Live, shalom to you on Facebook Live, and shalom, shalom to you on YouTube, YouTube Live, which is on your channel. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, the first time ever we do it simultaneously all for all, all platforms, and it's going to be interesting to see uh, how it come out. But I just want you to know that um, as far as I know, uh, I was thinking about it, this is the only Middle East update from the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many of them. And um, we're literally 70 miles away from Damascus. We are right across from the Golan Heights. We are right on the Sea of Galilee. And we wanted to give you a short update. Um, we're not newscasters. We're not uh, trying to be. This is not about only news. Pastor, what, why do you think it's so important as believers to be fully aware of what's going on? Well, we have a expectation and hope of the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to recognize the things going on around us. And Amir, I always think it interesting to go back to when Jesus was here walking the earth. Mm -hmm. And those who were the religious elite of the day, he rebuked them for not recognizing the signs of his coming and his deity. And he said, you know, you guys can predict the weather, but you didn't recognize that I am the one who fulfilled all the things that were written in the Old Testament scripture concerning uh, my coming, being born in Bethlehem, called a Nazarene, called out of Egypt, and the other things associated with his birth, born of a virgin. And uh, we live in a time, interestingly, Amir, where there are many who diminish or disparage even the teaching of prophecy when we know that the Bible is some 27% prophetic in nature. And there are, some have stated, eight times as many prophecies about the return of Christ as there were of his first coming. So we might even say we live in a sign-rich environment and how foolish and unprepared we are uh, not to acknowledge the things going on around us. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I also think that um, there's nothing wrong in acknowledging a political development around because when Jesus came, it was the Romans that occupied Judea that was a political power and that political power by the way was recognized by Daniel the prophet that will come and play a significant role in fulfillment of Bible prophecy so whether it's a political thing whether it's military development whether it's spiritual development everything around us is relevant to understand the Bible because the Bible is talking about all of those things well, that's what's so fascinating about being alive right now, because you might say, to use an Americanism, uh, we're running on all cylinders prophetically. Everything is happening. All the spokes on the wheel are in place and operational today, politically, militarily. The coalitions that the Bible predicted are now operating and cooperating together. 
uh, not just politically and not just diplomatically, but also militarily. We've got a strong military presence on the northern border of Israel, which was predicted by Ezekiel, and we're just waiting for that hook in the jaw to draw them out of the mm -hmm. north and bring them down into the land where God's going to deal rather decisively yeah. with them. Not only that, by the way, even financial situation is being part of what the Bible is talking about yes. as a, a characteristic of the end times. So it's financial, it's military, it's political. These are the things we cannot ignore. Well, that's a great point because if we look at the commonalities between the nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's an ideology that is shared, a religious ideology, and that being Islam, but also economic distress is a shared feature among these nations. We know is, uh, Russia is having difficulties. We know that uh, Turkey is having difficulties. We know the Iranians are having difficulties. The Sudan has been a mess for a long time, as has Libya. And yet there's one prosperous nation right in the heart of all these uh, that is doing quite well and now boasts the eighth largest economy in the world. And that nation is? The nation of Israel. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm proud to be part of it. But um, speaking of Iran, let's talk about it for a few seconds. They just celebrated 40 years to the um, revolution where Ayatollah Khomeini was allowed to fly back from Paris to Tehran and to take over. And um, the um, supreme leader, uh, Ayatollah, Hatte, Ayatollah um, Khamenei, Khamenei um, said that uh, Iran is actually in its worst shape financially, economically, uh, of the last 40 years. Uh, so um, I think that... Um, so let's celebrate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not seeing uh, the fruit of that uh, revolution. Yes. Besides uh, spreading terrorism and spreading violence and inciting people to destroy Israel. Um, but we see that they're with their back to the wall right now. They are, and they have that shared feature, as I said a minute ago, with those other nations. You know, Russia's Correct. been in economic distress for some time. Mm -hmm. We've talked about, you and I have talked about before, the prices of oil. You mm -hmm. know, to get it from ground to market is well under uh, the positive or the black ink, so to speak, of being a profitable venture for them. Yet we know that 60% of their gross domestic product is uh, energy-related products. Oil so, and gas. You know, and they've got to feed their military. Mm -hmm. uh, their military uh, showcasing has not been doing so well exactly. either with some of the forays of Israel uh, into some Syria. Some of what Israel does, and also they have their own share of crashing planes uh, and right. all of that. And, and they're pretty angry. By the way, yesterday, um, Egypt decided to purchase um, French-made fighter jets uh, and cancel their order of the Russian-made fighter jets. Mm. And so the Russians are not happy. Um, and so they started fake news uh, about, um, about how bad the French manufactured uh, plane is and the fact that it, one of them crashed a couple days ago with a senior Egyptian pilot on it. And they said, okay, you see, that's, that's not good. You need to buy something from us. But hey, a couple days earlier, it was the Russian plane that crashed. Yeah. Uh, and, and this one, you won't hear from them. But uh, speaking of Iran, they may not have a lot of money f to feed their own people, but what do they do with their money? Well, they fund terrorism. Yes. Uh, they have proxies uh, basically on the northern border of Israel right now through Hezbollah. We know they feed money into Hamas. And it's kind of interesting to see some of the things we talked about, uh, just you and I personally, over the past few days, with uh, low-altitude missile tests and things of that Correct. nature. And, uh, you know, here they are, you know, they've got a, a huge percentage of their population is under 30. And the uh, unemployment rate in some areas is up to 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, people are in distress financially, and yet here they are, you know, still testing missiles, still trying yep. to figure out a way to bring about what yep. their national goal is, at least as far as the leadership, which is the destruction of Israel. It's very interesting. They just announced uh, the release of a new missile that has a, a range of 1,300 kilometers. Um, and they just threatened Europe that if Europe is not going to allow them to continue and develop uh, ballistic missiles, they will develop one that will reach Europe. Yes. Um, beautiful approach. Great people, huh? great regime. <laughs> That's um, a good way to extend it, the hand. Up your neighbor, unbelievable. Huh? Um, I want to say something. I saw videos over the last few days, uh, speaking of the young population of Iran, um, 
In most of the universities in Iran, the regime painted the American and Israeli flags on the floor, so every student will just walk on them uh, as he enters the university. And the video, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it later and I'll post it uh, so you can see, the video actually shows that almost 100% of the students are just jumping over, hopping right. over, so they will not step on those flags. And that tells you that the new generation is not really buying this Islamic propaganda uh, that hates Israel so much. In fact, they learn to identify who the good guys and who the bad guys are. And as they chant in the streets, they don't know, they no longer chant death to America and death to Israel when they truly have popular uprising. They're actually saying, death to the dictatorship that is Ayatollah. ruling, yeah, to the Ayatollahs. This is a great, great change, I think. Well, it's interesting, too, if you pair that with the fact that there have been, uh, the last number I heard was almost a million postings by women who are taking off the hijab exactly. and dancing out in the street and being mm -hmm. filmed and really putting themselves at risk. Many of them, you'll see, are covering their faces so it can't be seen, yeah. but they're saying no to the oppressive regime uh, that took over in 1979, mm -hmm. and they're not celebrating uh, with the administration, so to yeah. speak, of the dictatorship, I should say. We noticed here in the Israeli intelligence community, we noticed something very interesting going on in Iran in relation to Venezuela. Mm. Um, we noticed that on the Iranian channels, they only show the popular support of uh, Maduro right. and uh, him being confident that he's in power. But on all of the uh, social media uh, sources, they are watching an inspired nation, uh, inspired by international support, and um, a determination to remove Maduro from power. And the Iranians are very concerned because if that is going to go well in Venezuela, they know that they could be next. And you're seeing this happening around the world on, on two fronts. You brought up two points. One, the necessity to control the narrative. You know, and the, controlling the media, you'll see in all of these socialistic regimes and any type of tyrannical uh, regime, you're going to see the need to control and have a state-run media where the information that is pumped out there is going to be determined by those in power so the picture can be presented that they want the world to see. Yet we see in all these other areas that you just mentioned, on the streets, the story is different. Completely and, different. And fake news uh, is not something that's exclusive to Donald Trump and the U.S. media. Mm -hmm. It's something that's long been happening around the world. And it is, again, uh, Mir, it's an effort to advance that globalistic mentality or, or the ultimate dictator that's going to come uh, during the tribulation mm -hmm. period and rule the world with an iron fist. It's interesting because they, um, it took the Iranians five months to reach the inflation that the Venezuela had two years to reach. And uh, it seems like the situation in Iran is far m more dire than, than the one in Venezuela, if you compare. Um, and so they're truly afraid that um, their end is really around the corner. Yes. And, and, um, I think that when a regime like that, that is super, um, uh, you know, extreme um, and is having no problem um, lying and feeding the world with, with deception as a strategy, it, it seems like they will have no problem doing even worse things, both to their own people and, of course, all around in the neighborhood just to survive. Yeah. The interesting part about that, as far as the Ezekiel scenario goes, is we know there's an economic attachment to it. And the protesting nations, the Arab states, uh, Gulf states that is, uh, Saudi Arabia obviously leading the charge, and the questioning of those nations being pulled down or drawn down out of the north. And they ask if there's an economic attachment to the reason uh, for this invasion, you know, to come to plunder and take booty. And you know, Amir, I think the interesting part about this is we don't know the day or the hour Correct. of the Lord's return. Mm -hmm. What we can recognize, as Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees, the signs in the sky, so to speak. We can recognize that there are uh, potentially things that are going to develop and be the fulfillment of what was written long ago by the prophets, and that would include 
what we're talking about here. Because one, we do know that Persia is going to play a significant role Correct. in the invasion. <clears throat> we do know they share with Russia and Turkey economic distress with Libya and the Sudan as well. And therefore, it seems as though it's possible that with this economic distress, rather than allowing the collapse of the Ayatollah's regime, they're going to go after a place where they can uh, gain some uh, economic balance. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Um, let's move to uh, Pope Francis. Um, I'm not a big fan of, you know, always talking about him because it's not him. It's a huge religion. Mm -hmm. uh, however, for the first time in the history, the Pope is visiting the Arabian Peninsula. He just landed last night in Abu Dhabi and he's about to take uh, part in inter-religious dialogue conference. How do we see that play out in the Bible, this whole inter-religious dialogue effort? Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. Uh, one, we recognize that on every level, the order of the day in the last days leading into the tribulation is what's called egalitarianism. And it's simply that all things have to be equal. And that's really what the socialist agenda is as far as controlling people. Everyone has to have the same thing. No one can be of more value uh, economically in their uh, production, whether it be being a doctor or uh, a janitor or whatever. Everybody has to be equal pay. But we've been seeing this move also in the realm of religion, where mm -hmm. we often hear about the phrase, the three Abrahamic religions. Uh, in the last days, it's obvious that no one can say that they have an exclus uh, uh, exclusivity on accessing heaven. But this is something that's frowned upon by so uh, society and culture today. And therefore, it's moving into that realm where there's going to be a single system of religion, a single system of commerce, uh, a single, obviously, uh, oversight of the world by the Antichrist. Mm. Uh, and we're seeing the precursors to all that, and I think this is significant because it is just that. Uh, you know, we all, according to many in the world, we all worship the same God. And there's many roads to God or avenues to reach uh, the same God. And this is a baton or an olive branch, if you will, that's being offered out, in a sense, by the Pope to these other major religions to say, yes. hey, you know what, let's just all kind of come to an agreement, focus on our commonalities rather than mm -hmm. our differences, and uh, this is really a significant step moving it is. toward uh, one world religion. I, I also call all of these type of conferences, Jesus is not the only way conference. Yes. <laughs> because uh, in reality, that's what they're saying. Hey, you know, your religion is great. It's, and by the way, just, just so you know, the Muslims had a hard time with the previous um, Pope because he associated some violent activity to Islam. And God forbid, Islam is a religion of peace. It, it has never committed any violence, uh, and so how dare you say that? Well, Pope Francis, from day one, completely disconnected violence from Islam. And always, always in every opportunity said, it's a religion of peace, it's a religion of peace. And, and then, I don't know if you remember, but when there is the Charlie Hebdo, massacre in Paris where they killed all the people who were running that magazine um, Pope Francis was asked it was he was pretty new in his office and he was asked what do you have to say and he said well if somebody comes in and, and insults you would not you do something about it also in other words he justified mm -hmm. the terror activity um, as if um, you know they were provoked therefore they had a no, they had their right to react like that. Um, I think that we are watching, a, for the first time, a Pope that is completely in the mindset of being a leader of the whole world. And, and he crossed already the lines of religious affairs only. He is now leading also in environmental issues, in global warming issues, in, um, you know, uh, suddenly he speaks of uh, borders are not necessary and uh, they're evil. Um, although the Vatican is surrounded by a by wall, walls. the last time I, che <laughs> I checked. And um, so I'm saying to myself, are we watching 
someone who is paving the way as a false prophet or as a the religious pers persona uh, is he the one who is going to pave the way for the political figure well again I think things are running on all cylinders so to speak I think the world is moving towards that mentality uh, people you know it's odd to me especially in the United States that uh, Islam is protected Christianity is disparaged uh, we're the enemy of you know, all things good and moving forward mm. uh, toward the goal of the world of just being accepting of everyone, yet the most unaccepting religion of anyone except for what they believe yeah. is protected and promoted by the U.S. government. So, right. you know, Amir, I always like to think about the fact that there's really two hindrances to the advancement of the globalistic religion or the system of the worship of the beast. And the two hindrances are Islam and Christianity. Uh, neither are going to bow to the other, ever. And so, one, I think we're, we'll probably uh, need to put out on the table the fact that Christianity is going to be removed from the face of the earth. And then Islam, uh, most likely, I know, again, we don't know exactly when it's going to go down, but if you look at the nations in the coalition of Ezekiel 38 and 39, they represent radical Islam by and large. They're not moderate Islam, exactly. they're rather the jihadist uh, mentality. And so if you combine the rapture of the church with the destruction of radical Islam, possibly early during the tribulation, you really removed mm -hmm. uh, the two major hindrances to the advancement of the, yes. the ministry of the false prophet. So is this, again, using the colloquialism, greasing the skids? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about it. I, I've never seen Christians running to Muslim countries to embrace Islam as much as I see Muslims running towards Christian countries to find refuge there and it seems to me like um, there is more interest among Muslims to live uh, uh, to leave their religion and to live among Christians than of Christians to leave Christianity and to live among Muslims um, I always thought that the Ezekiel war because of the nature of the of the events uh, will sort of be the grand finale of of, of, of um, the extreme Islamic faith mm -hmm. because it's not going to be Israel that will show his great strength the Bible says at the end of Ezekiel 38 it says that God is the one who is going to fight and it will be evident that it's him yes. and everyone will know it's him so they will understand this is you know we can't fight them we can't defeat them this is far beyond us um, and I think they will, they're searching already for something that better. And I think that that search will even be greater after that war. And uh, right now the Vatican is, 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 is literally offering a Jesus-less Christianity and a very watered-down gospel. So it will be easy for everyone to swallow and to uh, adopt. Do you think so? Well, absolutely. And if you look at what happens during the tribulation, we're told that the whole world falls after the beast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you've got this grassroots movement within Islam for the man on the street, especially the women are saying, no more of this, no more of this oppression, uh, you know, money going elsewhere, and all the other things that we've talked about. And then you combine that with the fact that the radicalism being destroyed, uh, the church being removed, share the pre-tribulation yeah. rapture view and um, you know really you've just got the door open but you know like everything else there's a lot of things right now that are happening that are precursors to the things that will be fully developed yes. during the tribulation mm. period and that's why I think that's so important that you pointed this out that we're seeing this movement within you know there's 1.4 billion Catholics on the face of the earth yep. right now I and agree. here you've got the man uh, at the top who declares himself to be the vicar of Christ or the earthly representative of Christ saying you know what we need to just all get along yeah we need to all share mm -hmm. uh, our common so features. we talked about Iran we talked about Russia you mentioned Turkey a little bit in nine days it was ten days yesterday in nine days the leaders of Iran Russia and Turkey will meet again yes. in the um, beautiful city by the Black Sea Sochi mm -hmm. and uh, 
what are they going to talk about? I mean, this is not the first meeting. No. And uh, what is the common ground for all three of them? Because they hate the, each other's guts, by the way. Yes. I mean, just to make it very, very clear to all of you behind me, all of you in front of me, and all of you back home, Russia doesn't like Iran. Iran doesn't like Russia. Turkey doesn't like both. But who is going to be the glue for all three? <laughs> We're sitting in that. Exactly. <laughs> we're, we're, we're sitting at, at literally missile range. Um, right. Not that I'm trying to scare you. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's probably our final issue yes. and final thought. A lot of people think that teaching prophecy is scary. I just talked about the coming war, and by the way, we're, <laughs> we're right around the corner from missiles and rockets that are aiming towards Israel. I have a question, are you afraid? No. All right, we pay them to say <laughs> um, But I, I just want to tell you something. Um, there's some people that don't get it. Teaching prophecy has nothing to do with scaring people. Right. It's, it's like um, putting a mirror in front of you. Oh, if, you, if you're scared when you see that, then, you know. <laughs> but my point is, Jesus commanded us to believe to all that the prophets have spoken. Mm -hmm. Not just listen to it, not just read it, but believe. And also, I think, from what I see from the story of the road to Emmaus, he related or he connected the complete lack of understanding of the things concerning him, he connected it with the lack of believing in, 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 in the words of the prophets. And when Jesus walked with the two, the two disciples, they talked about current events. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they talked about the Romans in Jerusalem. They talked about Jesus as a political figure that failed to take position as a, a king. They talked about um, what happened by the priest and the people and they didn't even quote one verse <laughs> they only talked about current events and Jesus is the one who said your problem is that you're looking at all the things that are happening all around you and you do not connect it with the Bible therefore you don't understand and therefore in their case they were afraid they were embarrassed they were angry they were sad whatever and people today in the church they watch messages on Bible prophecy and they are scared and they're angry and they're sad and how sad it is that they're sad and um, what do you have to say about that well interesting that we see so often history repeat itself and mm -hmm. I think even with the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples you know when they asked the question about we at this time restore the kingdom I mean they were thinking too short term and we have many today who are looking for a change on the face of the earth or through dominion theology or kingdom now theology that uh, things are going to change here uh, on the surface of the earth so to speak for those who are god's people and where the lord is trying to point us to is what he did when he sat down with peter andrew james and john on the mount of olives yeah and they asked him a question about the signs of his coming and he gave the longest answer he gave to any question in scripture and we call it the olivet discourse he went into great detail concerning the time of the end. He gave them specifics. He told them uh, in the midst of all of it, he said, therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming. And I like to look at this as though he was reminding us that there would be a time of low expectation. Mm -hmm. He's coming at a time when he's not expected to return. And we live really in an age where because the dominant feature within the church concerning Israel is replacement theology, where we know that many outside of that belief system have dominion theology as their approach to the last days the church has to have uh, commercial dominion over the earth has to have religious dominion over the earth uh, has to have dominion just really on every level over the earth before jesus can come back yeah but we know that jesus said you know what it's going to be like it was in the days of noah the earth will be filled with violence thoughts and intents of man's heart is only going to be evil continually and he said therefore you also be ready. When you see yes. these things, your redemption is not. When you see them beginning or at their 
uh, initiation or the uh, birth pain stage. And look up. Look up. Your redemption yes. is nice. So, boy, if there's anything that needs to be heard in the church today, it's look up. Look Don't up. look around. Don't look down. Yeah. Look Seek up. the things Jesus which are above. Coming. That's yes. right. And, and it's important because if there is one thing that we always talk about is the blessed hope that we have. Mm -hmm. And if there is another thing that we always uh, refrain from doing is setting dates and trying even to set names. Um, hey, I'm a great advocate of what the Bible says that there are appointed, God has set appointed times. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour. I don't even want to know the day and the hour. But God said through the word, the apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonian chapter five of the first epistle, he says, concerning the times and the seasons, my brothers, you have no need for me to write to you because you perfectly know. Mm -hmm. In other words, we do we perfectly know? Because if we don't, then we're in trouble. We should perfectly know the times and the seasons. Not the day, not the hour, but the times and the seasons. And every time he's telling us of the blessed hope, he's, he's saying, and therefore, comfort one another with these That's words. Right. Encourage one another with these words. The purpose of these type of updates is not to scare, but to prepare. And the purpose of these updates are act is actually to encourage people and, and to comfort people. We were yesterday at Capernaum, the village, or the town of the Comforter. Jesus brought comfort even 2,000 years ago to the people here who were in darkness in the valley of the shadow of death. And He can bring comfort to you even today with the hope that you are not alone. He sent the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago and then He said, but I will come back to receive you unto myself so where I am, and He is not here, He's up there, for I am, you will also be. We are about to change address. And yes, if you look at the things of this world, you better be scared. Because it's terrible. The world is terrible. The world is going down. But we don't have anymore the earthly citizenship. We have a new citizenship. Right. And we're going home. That's why whenever a believer passes away, we say he's gone home. That's our home. Heaven is our home. That's right. And then, so I think these are great words of hope and not of uh, some intimidation. Well, Amir, as you know, Paul was in Thessaloniki for three weeks. And within that three weeks, he taught them about prophecy. And mm -hmm. that's why he could write them in his second epistle. You know, listen, you don't, you're not of the darkness. You're not of the night. This isn't going to overtake you like a thief uh, because we already talked about these things. So you should live in expectation yeah. of these things. And, uh, he said, you don't know, you remember that when yeah, I was exactly. with you? Yeah, yeah. so it was important enough within a three-week visit to cover the issues concerning prophecy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I like that Philippians reminds us that someday uh, we're going to put on glorious bodies. Yes, and amen. These lowly bodies will be transformed mm. in the glorious bodies. Mine's going to have a big, massive head of hair. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's just going to be awesome. First time in my life, I'll have thick hair. You know, I saw I a picture of you with hair. Now, whoa. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw you jump. Yeah, you saw it? It was so funny because I was not ready for that one. So I uh, thank you for showing that to me because now when I see you in heaven with the hair and everything, You'll it'll be easier for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, folks, listen, uh, we've, we've covered a lot, but truly the aim of the teachings and conferences and the teachings online and the teaching in churches is to give the people of God once again the understanding of the blessed hope that we have in this, yes, evil world, mm -hmm. in this deteriorating world, in this falling apart world, and as... Jan Markell always says, things are not falling apart, things are falling in place. place. That's right. Yeah, and for us, so we don't have the fear, we don't have the despair, we don't have the, the anxiety. Uh, we, we have hope, we have great future, and we run the race and fight the good fight, not looking at what's going around us, but looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. So folks, back home and you guys all around us, 
in a few seconds. Let me show you something, by the way. Let me show. I know that here on Instagram, I'm sorry, you won't be able to see. You on YouTube, probably not. But on Facebook, I want you to see the sun is about to rise right above the Sea of Galilee. And this is a beautiful, beautiful morning here. It's Monday morning. I know it's Sunday evening in the west coast of the United States. It's Monday morning here and the sun is about to rise. And guess what we're about to do right now? Um, Pastor Barry, what are we going to do right now? What? I mean, this whole group of people didn't just wake up to watch this. We're here to worship. Yes, we are. We're here to worship. We have our songbooks, we have music, and we're going to sing to the Lord, and we are going to have a wonderful day. Um, and there's a good chance we might do another broadcast from the Syrian border about other things. We may, we may not. I don't know. I might fall asleep because of the <laughs> ungodly so hour I had to wake up this morning. <laughs> but um, I just want you to know that... Uh, as always, we want you to be encouraged and to uh, to look up because your redemption, yeah. our redemption, is drawing near. And one other, if I can, yes, butt in here for a minute. One of the things I think that's important about prophecy is because we believe what the Bible says about the last days and the tribulation period, it ought to motivate us to increase our efforts to reach people with the gospel. Mm. Uh, because those who are, and that's why Jesus gave that admonition. Therefore, you also be ready. And the only way to be ready for the rapture of the church is to give your heart to Christ, submit your life to Him as your Lord and Savior. And uh, therefore, you know, Amir, as we study Revelation 6 to 19, there are cataclysmic and catastrophic events that we don't want anyone to have to experience. And therefore, it ought to be a motivating factor for us. To get out there and tell people, mm. even people we told a thousand times, tell them a thousand and one. Tell them that Jesus loves them. Tell them that God sent his son into the world as the world's only savior and the only means by Amen. which we can escape the things which are about to come upon the whole world. Yes. People are going to perish, but the promise we have in John 3.16 is, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he whosoever believes in him will not perish. So uh, the promise that we have is eternal life and great time even here on earth right now until then once we trust uh, Jesus. So it's, it's super important that we all understand that um, to be ready for His coming is only if you trust in Him, if you believe in Him, if mm -hmm. you fully uh, gave your heart and your life to Him. And it's not too late now, it might be too late tomorrow. Um, today is the day of salvation. salvation. There is an urgency in the scriptures. Um, and it's because God is not slacking as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. All of you Calvinists, listen to me. God does not wish that any should perish, but that all will come to the knowledge, to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So, um, the God that we worship is a God that loved the whole world mm -hmm. and He gave His Son to the whole world. And we see great revival, great things happening in Iran and in Africa and in South America and in, in, even in Russia and all over Southeast Asia. We see great, great, great number of people uh, uh, coming to faith in China, of course, in other places. We see that this is the fastest growing, by the way, I don't know if you know that, the fastest growing religion, uh, they call it religion, but it's actually evangelical Christianity right now mm -hmm. in so many parts around the world. So God is on the move, um, but, but again, we need to remember that trusting in Him and believing in Him and living our lives for Him is the only way to be ready. If you ask yourself, are, am I ready? for the coming of the Lord. It's awesome too, Amir, with what we're doing right now, because there are places today where the missionaries' feet can no longer tread. Yes. But yet devices like a phone or yep. some other medium can reach the world with the gospel. So I think this is important that mm. we 
take advantage of the technology yes. we have today to make sure we're reaching into places Amen. Uh, where the message that we proclaim is forbidden uh, by law. So we're going to end up this broadcast with the Aaronic blessing, but for the first time I will do it in Hebrew and someone else will do it in English. Are you up for that? <laughs> okay. There you go. So let me proclaim the Aaronic blessing in Hebrew over all of you. We're not doing that as priests over you people. Mm -hmm. We're all priests. Uh, but um, it's a wonderful way to see the heart of God um, and to understand what we need to do also. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai pana v'lecha v'yichunecha Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Guard your heart and mind Amen. through Christ Jesus. The Prince of Peace, the Lord of Peace, who gives you peace now and forever, here and everywhere. Amen. Amen. God bless you all back home. Shalom from the Sea of Galilee, from where two-thirds of the gospel took place. Um, and um, we'll let you go to worship wherever you are. We are going to worship the King from here. Take a look. The sun is about to rise right above the Sea of Galilee. <coughs> Shalom and God bless you from the Sea of Galilee. Bye-bye.